I would say that in my lifetime, the most important move was probably in 1973, when we took Lee and Fung public and ended its era as a pure private family company, run along the lines of many overseas Chinese families and made it, brought it into sort of the more, I would say, a professional uh, management era. It was very clear to me at that point that uh, unless you separated ownership and management, it would be very hard to attract professional managers because they see that, well, everyone in the company is a Fong, you know, it's going to be very hard to be uh, important in the company. When I first came back into the family company, first of all, uh, people must understand that we're a typical overseas Chinese family company. My grandfather, who started the company, uh, was actually a Catholic. So the fortunate thing was that he only had one wife. <laughs> and as a result, however, my grandmother had 11 children. Okay, same wife, 11 children. And, uh, and I have, in my generation, third generation, we're something like 30 something cousins. So you can imagine the complexities of most big uh, family companies are all there. Having said that though, I think the family recognized that bringing, taking it public uh, means that you bring in corporate governance and you bring in a public supervision. You're bringing in outside directors. You're setting a regular dividend policy and then your, your shares have value whether you decide to sell or not and you have the freedom to do that. And in fact, in many ways, it overcame a lot of the initial hesitance of the family to go public. Uh, I am the third generation. There were many instances that if we didn't change, we would have died. We would have gone into oblivion. My grandfather started a company in 1906 in China. If you ever seen the movie, The Last Emperor, that was when it was alive, the end of the Qing Dynasty. And so he went through revolutions and, and, and wars. But uh, our business relied upon China as a hinterland. You know, at that time, in my grandfather's days, we exported things like porcelain, silk, tea, and so on. And you could imagine that in 1949, uh, with the change of regime in China, and when China turned inwards and started uh, you know, the bamboo curtain and all that, we actually lost our hinterland. And Li and Fung lost the source of his business, of his products. So we had to totally reinvent ourselves or we would not have survived. And in fact, that's what my father's generation did. What he did, of course, was to utilize uh, the labor that came into Hong Kong, you know, after the, take, uh, the, the People's Republic's Foundation 49. And uh, Hong Kong started doing the labor intensive types of manufacturing for export uh, that Hong Kong was known for in that period. And so he switched the company completely in terms of product base from Chinese products to Hong Kong made products. And in fact, it was a different business. And then when I came back in the 70s, uh, Hong Kong it was a victim of its own success. Because it was so successful in the export arena that uh, Hong Kong's standard of living rose. As a result, of course, wages rose, naturally. And as a result, it was not competitive in these labor-intensive types of manufacturing. In fact, everything's gone, all the business gone to Taiwan. So what I did was to follow the business because my customers also asked me to go to Taiwan. So I set up in Taiwan. And I remember uh, six months after I set up in Taiwan, my new staff came to me and they said, you know, Mr. Fong, we don't know why you've come to Taiwan. We're finished here. We're too expensive. Everything's gone to Korea. So we set up in Korea. And pretty soon, the, the, the Korean manufacturers saying that we can't compete with the Thais, the Indonesians, the Filipinos. So that's why for us, change is constant. And that's why we always have to keep changing ourselves. We, we hope to run one company, which really means for me one culture. You know, I think it's very important because a lot of the competitive advantage of companies is not in the hardware, it's in the software. And not only is it's in the mentality of the people, and, and, and especially with our customers who look to us for global sourcing. They look to us for, to give them a, the same assessment for the whole global uh, situation. They want people to think and, and react and behave and serve basically in the same general way. They don't want completely different cultures in different countries. Otherwise, why would they use one organization like Li and Fung instead of finding who's the best in each country, right? And so that means our people have got all to have synchronized our, 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 our approach to customers, our thinking and our culture. And the way we do that is to make sure that our culture is also subject to change and open-ended 
and it encompasses the common elements of the culture of the different countries we work in and the different economies. We essentially producing uh, in the developing countries and most of that is in the so-called East. And our customers, because of the products we make, are primarily in the developed countries, what you would broadly say West. So naturally, even within our company, there are this East-West versus West culture. Not versus, but it must be again a melding. And again, we hope to take the best parts of each. You know, and especially in the way we uh, treat our own staff. I would say the, the, the West has a different attitude. Uh, the East is probably much more um, concerned about staff longevity in the company, the way you treat the staff. I think that my first assumption is that any business organization is part and parcel of the community and the society you operate in. It cannot be totally different. Okay, so that means the, the, the norms and the mor mor morals of the uh, society you're in must be taken into account when you deal with people. You know, for example, I don't agree with the way that uh, layoffs are done. You know, the Chinese have a saying that the mountain and the stream meets San Su Yao Xiang Feng. You never do that. You know, these are things that about the culture and the society that uh, I learned, frankly, after my schooling, formal schooling. I learned it from uh, being in business and from my father, frankly. He would tell me, for example, that a company is like a mirror. Okay, how you treat the employee is how the employee treats you. If you are callous, if you are not caring, if you don't care about longevity uh, of your staff, the same with them. They don't care about having a career with you. If somebody pays them more, they'll go. Victor and I, I work together, my brother Victor mm -hmm. Fung, and, and we're, we're really very clear about concepts of how, how businesses work. In terms of CSR, corporate social responsibility, what, what we feel is that um, there's a sort of a, a more hard-nosed norm which says that the framework within which companies operate is set by government and it's usually legal. And I think what's happening nowadays, especially in the last few years during the financial tsunami, is that uh, societies and communities have lost a bit of faith in whether the government can set that framework properly and whether the uh, uh, companies are not even colluding with the government to, to bias the framework against the normal man in the street. And I think the, the key reason for that is because of this frame of mind that as long as the responsibility is the government to set the framework and I, I as a company will do just what is legal. That is not good enough in today's world. Things like pollution, if you're in a polluting industry, a lot of times you can say, well, I'm perfectly legal because the government allows me this much pollution. But the community you are living in may not, okay? And they will be, there'll be an outcry. So you've got to now tighten it. So I, I see the company setting its own boundaries within the government boundary, you know, as to what is acceptable behavior and what is not and what is good behavior and what is not, and what is socially responsible behavior and what is not. And the reason why we're also probably more sensitive than a lot of other companies to this is because in our job, where we are sourcing product for uh, 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 global companies who have a very big stake in their brand name, okay, where we source from is of key concern to our customers. Every country writes perfect laws, I would say, but the enforcement by the country itself is a probably the most problematic. And that's where Li Infung comes in. That's why we have so many people on the ground. That's why we don't source from a country. We don't fly into a country, contact a few factories and buy from them. We actually have people on the ground. That's why we have 30 something thousand people, you know, around the world. We we'll give them less temptation, you know, to deviate from them from the what is what is uh, what should be the, the code of conduct. And I think that's important. Let me try to be a little bit more controversial here and say that I don't know any company who doesn't say that uh, people is their biggest asset. Uh, frankly, most of the time they may be lying. <laughs> uh, but for us, if you look at, we don't have machinery, we don't have real estate, it's all people. We're a trading company, we're an intermediary. So, you know, we really don't have anything else. But so really people, people are really the biggest asset. So, you know, we, because of our background, you know, we, we were a small company like everybody else. Everybody starts off as a, as a small and medium-sized enterprise, SME. Okay, and we grew, but our, our, our mentality and our DNA is shaped by us competing with many, many other smaller companies who are really entrepreneur-run, owner-operated, usually. And, and they, they exhibit characteristics which we talked about earlier, like thinking small. So that tends for us to say that we must be organized in small, small units, small profit units as well, where the head of that profit unit is like a, we call it little John Wayne, Really, what it means is a shorthand was saying that he must be almost like a small loban in, in Chinese who runs his own company. And he must, he must feel like he's, this is his company. 
smaller company that he's running within a bigger framework of a Li and Fong. That's the sort of person we want. Not again, as I said, somebody who feels he's in the bureaucracy and he's just doing a job and he's a functionary. That's not the kind of person we want. That's when I say we hide for character and personality. That's part of the characteristic, character traits that we look for. Somebody who's independent, entrepreneurial, a go-getter. Someone who says that I want to earn more if I work harder. You know, these are not the people who go nine to five. You know, and no matter how hard or, or how, how little they work, you know, there, there's no difference in that conversation. You must make that a difference. So all the, everything in the system must come together.